Jordan Peterson, the controversial Canadian intellectual and best-selling author, has had a very interesting discussion with Jonathan Pajo, who's an orthodox carver and commentator, which touched on many issues that I think are key in the understanding both of Christianity today, but also the broader question of our spiritual intelligence, our capacity to understand the very nature of our being. And I wanted to see whether I could add three comments really to unpack something of what they said. The first might come under this question of how to be a Christian, because Jordan Peterson is clearly very intrigued by Christianity. Jonathan Pajo was trying to hold to him a rich picture of the appeal of Christianity. But I think there was a piece that perhaps Jordan Peterson was missing and a clue for it came because he talked a lot about C.S. Lewis and C.S. Lewis's famous conversion which was when he realised that mythology and history can combine. Lewis famously spent a lot of his early life grappling with how the truths that come through from the timeless stories that cultures and traditions convey can actually land as reality in our day-to-day -day experience in history. And it said that J.R. Tolkien and others persuaded them that this was so, that the figure Jesus was both a historical man who lived at a certain time and the embodiment of the great myths, particularly of gods dying and rising again and linking heaven and earth. Now, Peterson was struggling with this and it made me feel that the bit that wasn't discussed, um, but was in the background of Lewis's conversion, was the contribution of another of the Inklings, less known than Tolkien, Owen Barfield, whom I've written about and find very inspiring. Because what Barfield was able to explain was why Jesus was born in this particular moment, why it was not just a chronological moment, as it were, set on a calendar, which always feels rather arbitrary, why then? And 2,000 years on, that can lead people to, to struggle because it was also a Kairos moment. It was the right time in terms of a greater unfolding, which Barfield identified by particularly looking at the history of words and how words can be used as what he called fossils of consciousness, showing how human experience, human mentality unfolded over time. And what this can be used to demonstrate is that there was an unfolding that began maybe 500 years or so before the birth of Jesus, which Jesus can be understood as the culmination of. Now this can be told in, in a number of ways, and I do go into this in my own book, A Secret History of Christianity. But one way to do it is to think about the Hebrew tradition, which I know Peterson is very interested in, in his biblical commentaries, and how about 500 years ago, around the time of the ex about 500 years before Jesus, around the time of the exile, the Hebrew people, at least one group of the ancient Hebrews, the now called Deuteronomists, started to remake their tradition to speak to their contemporary moment. And in particular, they brought to the fore the figure of Moses. There's one part of the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, where the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, play the central role. And there's another part now where Moses plays the central role, particularly in the book of Deuteronomy. Um, so hence the story of Exodus, the story of wandering in the wilderness, crucially features like Moses dying before they get to the promised land. He's portrayed as a prophet, telling an inner story rather than a patriarch, telling a social story. And I think what this begins to demonstrate is that a new sense of being human was emerging amongst the Hebrews that you can also find in other traditions, not least the ancient Greeks, that awakened people to the truth that the divine is primarily known 
within the individual. The story of Moses before the burning bush and hearing Yahweh say, I am that I am, became a, cr a key story now because what it spoke to the people of is how when they developed their sense of being an individual, being I am, being able to say I am, they found the divine I am as the ground of that capacity. For, if you remember, Jacob, the patriarch, had had a theophany and he had to change his name to Israel, to one who wrestled, struggled with God. Whereas Moses has a different realisation. It's as it were in the telling of his story now. He awakens to a truth that was there all along, that his being and the divine being is one being. And Judaism emerges at this point as we understand it, or at least the precursor to rabbinic Judaism. The word Judaism itself starts to emerge. Judaism becomes an ethnicity, particularly in the diaspora. And new elements of the religion start to unfold, the most obvious of which is that texts are written down. The Bible itself is born. And that's significant because when you have as your practice reading a text on a page, as opposed to, say, taking part in collective activities like going to ancestral land, visiting particular places like the temple, the text on the page cultivates this sense of the divine speaking to you directly from within because your mind goes to the words that receives from the texts and so in between you and the text is born this third thing which is the presence of the divine felt within so scripture itself cultivates this sense of connection other institutions are born in what christians call the intertestamental period for example the synagogue there's no synagogues in the Old Testament. The New Testament is full of synagogues. Synagogues being places where individuals gather together in community to be taught. And of course, one of the early stories of Jesus is that he astonished the elders in the temple because he, a Jew taught in the synagogue, understanding his I amness, knew of this new awareness of God. And then this also coincides with the emergence of monotheism proper. Um, it's often remarked that in the Old Testament and Hebrew Bible, monotheism is something that emerges re relatively late, in fact, in its full form. It's only in what's called Deutero Isaiah that God is said to be the only God, not just one God amongst many gods. And that perception of monotheism is only possible when the sense of being the individual has fully formed because then the oneness of God, as it were, reflects in the oneness of the person and it can be comprehended, it can be seen, understood. Whereas in a polytheistic culture, the sense of being human is very different. Um, the connection is more like a cosmology where different parts of the human reflect different parts of the environment and are held together as a multiplicity rather than being grounded in the one. And the point about Jesus is that he is born in this Kairos moment when these things have been unfolding for several centuries and brings them together so that when people look on Jesus, I think during his lifetime, but certainly afterwards, they see what Christians came to call the incarnation, that this one person was the Logos incarnate, that his humanity and his divinity completely and perfectly coincided as a fulfillment, a flourishing of what it is to be human. And so Christians started saying things like God became man so that man might become God, which Jonathan Padger mentioned in the discussion. Not, I think, as something to try and achieve, something to struggle towards anymore, it was Jacob who struggled, but as something to realise, to know that always already was the case. Now, of course, there might be a lot of struggle to get to that point, but ultimately, this is a moment of realisation, a moment of clarity, um, rather than something that must be somehow sort of reached out for, which I think is where Peterson's at, so far as you know, I can tell, just looking on some of what he's putting out right now. Um, how to be a Christian, you might say, is not to try and go the Lewis route, make it stack up in your head, 
looking for the evidence and so on. It's rather to go the Barfield route, to look inside, to know yourself, as the Greeks put it, and to realise that in the ground of your own being already is the divine being, which is why we can say, I am. You know, sociologists and philosophers and other people look around for the kind of bit of our brain, if you like, in the neuroscience that is the I amness and come up with various possibilities, but tend to feel it doesn't really add up to much. We're actually multiple. Well, the Christian response, the theistic response, the spiritual response would be that's because our I amness actually rests in the ground of being itself, not in any manifestation that springs from being. And so that therefore always looks a bit fragmented and um, incoherent, unwhole. Now this leads me to a sort of second part of um, my thoughts on their discussion, which is about the ground of the individual. Um, Jonathan Pajot talked um, about this orthodox idea of theosis, that the goal of Christianity is oneness with God. And I think that's a hugely rich tradition, which I think Jonathan is right, that orthodoxy understands much better than Western Christianity. But it's there in Western Christianity, with the added inflection that theosis isn't just the end of our human calling. It's actually the beginning because of this business that our ground is already the divine ground. And in the West, Meister Eichhardt is one of the figures best known for making this observation. He could say that his eye and God's eye is one eye and one sight and one longing and one love. Knowing that he wasn't God at the same time, but knowing that his finite, separate, specific self in a certain time and place was a reflection of the oneness of the God. Um, you get this in the Sufi tradition as well with figures like Ibn Arabi, who use metaphors like light and mirrors, and they say the one light reflects on the many mirrors, which is our particularity. But it's all the one light, um, so multiplicity and unity come together. You might say that we are in God, God is not in us. And when you realise that sense, you know what has already been the case, and so the struggle ceases. If you feel that you've got to somehow get God into you, then the struggle is born. Which speaks to another way that Jordan Peterson was talking about these things, as, as if he needs to find the courage to accept these things. Um, this is very related to the archetype of the hero, which I think shapes a lot of his thoughts, the idea that there's a long journey with many trials that the individual must face in order that they can recover the true treasure. And it's understood as a kind of achievement, I think, often. Um, but really, it's not about an achievement at all. It's rather about a letting go. Um, the true journey that discovers the real treasure is as much about letting go of the false treasures, the pseudo kinds of glory, kinds of fame, kinds of wealth, in order that the true fame, glory and wealth might be realised as actually the possession of the individual all along. So there's something about the hero's tale um, which I think needs to be reformulated. Again, moving away from this idea that what's wanted is somehow distant to the path itself being the direct path, as is said in Advaita Vedanta, another wisdom tradition, um, which is this turning inwards and seeing what is already the case by phrases like knowing yourself. There is nothing to achieve, there is everything to see. Perception becomes the key spiritual organ of perception. And I think this speaks to another element which um, was kind of knocking around in the conversation, I think. Um, which is what can happen when the soul work, using archetypes, say, um, or using developmental maps as well, which um, psychology is so good at developing, but when those maps and symbologies become uncoupled from this ground, from this Aboriginal unity, they become as many rabbit holes down which people can disappear. If you like, people are trying to live the map rather than realising the map 
must be discarded. They're trying to stay in the symbol rather than realizing that the symbols are in the service of this deeper unity. And I think this leads to much of the fragmentation um, that Jonathan Pajot has talked about um, within the Western world, within Christianity, um, that what has been lost is the basis from which the maps, from which the symbols, um, from which the archetypes spring. And you get this in Jung, actually, in my view. He was always very clear that archetypes are just one way of talking about inner life, the depths of the psyche. And they should be as much discarded. There should be a kind of freedom in their use rather than a fixity in their deployment. Um, and that fixity comes across when every so often you start to think, wait a minute, is something about inner life being discussed here? Or is it actually something about biology? Um, the minute things start to get biological, you know they're getting a bit literal and the freedom of the spiritual realm is being lost. Which made me want to comment thirdly um, on the use of hierarchies, because the notion of the hierarchy is very strong in Jonathan Pajot's thought. Um, he sees himself, as it were, nested in a hierarchy and it brings him a kind of consolation, um, but also is part of his trust that um, the tradition he follows is onto the truth. And I get it. Um, you know, we do need to be in communities. We need to um, be able to speak to those who have realized these things more fully than ourselves um, as we not struggle to discover these things so much as then put in the effort to realign our lives so that they live according to these things. But I think one of the elements that for me needs bringing in more in relation to hierarchies, just to make my third point, is how hierarchies serve the unity. They themselves must have a clear quality of freedom and not become fixed, because the minute they become fixed, they become separate from the unity that they are designed to channel, to bring to us. Remember the word hierarchy comes from um, Dionysius the Areopagite who wrote about the hierarchies of angels and for him the way to understand the angels was seeing how we're connected to the one in a kind of cascade of light and intelligence and love. Um, we put together as it were a map of hierarchies but only so that we are free to be connected to the one and as it were the hierarchy collapses in that moment of felt connection. It's a kind of divine jazz you know if you've ever tried to learn some jazz music, you know that in a way you have to put in a lot of rigorous practice to learn musical hierarchies like scales and arpeggios and so on, but ultimately they're in the service of the jazz and the scales and arpeggios sort of disappear in the pure music. And I think that's the way to understand hierarchies within spiritual traditions as well, to be wary when they feel like they're becoming fixed, when as it were the symbol is crashing onto the biological as if that's a literal way that things must be, always will be. Um, the divine is always free, uses all these facets, the archetypes, the maps, the hierarchies, but always only to enable us to realize the oneness of our being in the divine being. And for me, a brilliant portrayal of all this is found in Dante's Divine Comedy, um, which I've been thinking a lot about recently. Um, Images are always really powerful in these discussions rather than so much trying to rationally stack them up or seek evidence uh, because images traverse worlds. They reach into the place that we're trying to perceive, trying to see and communicate that to us. Um, so, for example, in The Paradise, um, Dante, quite early on in the lower hierarchy, um, the heaven of the moon, um, meets the figure of Picarda. Um, who he knew in life, and he's quite outraged that she's in this lower part of the hierarchy. But Picardo explains that the things that went wrong for her, the injustices which were inflicted upon her, the suffering she underwent, became the means for her to realise that there was nothing that could separate her from the divine life, to use the Pauline expression. And so she appears now in the seemingly low part of the hierarchy, the heaven of the moon to Dante, so that Dante can also see that the obstacles in his life are actually 
the means by which when he lets go of his struggle with them, he sees this wider holding, this divine containment, which always already is sustaining and part of his life. And in fact, Picardo then says um, that, in fact, my true self, as it were, is now in the Imperium, is one with God. And she had just appeared in the sphere of the moon to show Dante this truth, that the hierarchies are in the service of the unity and that the divine freedom draws all things back to itself. Which also led me to a second encounter that Dante has with the contemplative Peter Damien in The Paradise. And Peter Damien explains to him what the contemplative life is about. In short, it's about this realisation of our divine ground. And he says it happens when, as a hermit, he gradually let go more and more of what he took to be important in life. And this created a space within which the divine light stirred. It had always been there, as it were, but he was able to see it because of the space that was created. Um, it's the emptiness, the nothingness, within which the infinite, the fullness, can be detected. And so what he says is that whilst in one moment it felt like he was enwombing God, and so following the type of the Virgin Mary who had said yes to God and so conceived the, the God-man Jesus, the truer realisation was that he was already enwombed in God. That was the fuller sense that he, as a contemplative, gained on earth. We are in God. It's not that God must somehow be got into us. So again, it's very fascinating how these symbols need to sort of change and evolve in order to reveal the fullest truth to us. And if you stick to one symbol too rigidly, you know, such as the Virgin Mary, um, who was the only pure one to be able to say yes to God and so not unite heaven and earth, then I think you miss the richer truth which that part of the symbol is pointing towards, which is that we are all always already in the divine and wombed in God. And the gift of this realisation is how are we going to bring that forth? How are we not going to understand it with our heads and our minds, um, but know it in our hearts so that it then manifests in our lives? The church tends not to project this, I think, because it feels too risky. Um, it's safer to tell people that there's something they need to get and we can show you how to get it rather than that something that is there to be realised and then to grow into. Um, the gift has been given, the question is how we enjoy it and manifest it in our lives. Um, you can understand why, you know, there's the sense that it might lead to chaos rather than order and so unleash um, all sorts of disasters in life, but of course there's plenty of disasters already been unleashed in life. And I do wonder whether we now live in a time where this older Aboriginal direct message is beginning to gain ground, that there's a kind of trinity, to use another Christian symbol, of our love, our desire, of our intellect, our perception, and of our freedom that comes together in the truth, if I may say and put it like this, that the question is not how to be a Christian, the question is how to realise that you already are a Christian, in inverted commas, which is to say that Christianity is just one way of talking about this truth which is at the heart, I believe, of all the wisdom traditions, that your being, my being, the being of the whole creation, is one being because it springs from and rests in the divine being. And if we really knew that, then the world really might change.